Today's shave, I use Coast to Coast from McDuff Soap, and I talk about William Alexander Morgan, the American who left America to fight in the Cuban Revolution. Stick around. Hey everybody, John Bonham here, Cape Cod Wet Shaving. How's it going? Good to see you again. Thanks for tuning back in. If you're new, thank you for checking out the video. Um, I'm going to be shaving and I will be talking about history. Um, mainly unknown history, usually, generally. Stuff that most people haven't heard of. So today's shave, I'm going to be using Coast to Coast with McDuff's, from McDuff's. I'm going to be continuing my month of McDuff's shaving. I'm going to go in an alphabetical order. I'm on to C now. Um, Coast to Coast. Oh, it's another one of my favorites. Um, Sean made this to commemorate uh, Canada Day. And the scent notes are ginger ale, maple syrup, rye whiskey, spice, herbs, citrus, and amber. This is a good one. It smells very citrusy to me. Uh, Gareth at the Shave Supply. How you doing, Gareth? Uh, recommended this one. This is one of his favorites, and it has become one of mine as well, like most other ones. From that vendor, from that artisan, excuse me, I'll be using the Matching splash. I'll be using Zingari Man, the master for the aftershave balm. Smells a little similar, it's a decent pairing, not bad. And for the pre shave, I'm using, as always, Subtle Art Soap, the citrus pre shave oil. Today, I'll be using the Parker 69CR open comb. I'll be using Astra Green Blades. I've been on an Astra fix, and I'll be using the T3. Trafager from Simpson, synthetic brush, along with my Colonel Conk mug. So, all right, can you get into this? So today I'm gonna to be talking about a guy named uh, William Alexander Morgan. And here's a picture of him. Pretty good looking dude. Either he was posing for that photo, which I'm pretty sure he was, or the cameraman was very unhappy slightly after that picture was taken. But pretty cool. Um, so he, this guy only lived to the age of 32. He had a really crazy life up until, up until his death. So he was born in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, April 19th, 1928 in Cleveland. He dropped out of high school. He was in trouble with the law an awful lot. He was a troublemaker, known troublemaker in the town. Um, Right after World War II, he decided to join the army. And uh, he married a woman named Darlene Edgerton. Uh, I don't know if that was a high school sweetheart. I couldn't find anything about her really. But I do know that the marriage was annulled about a year and a half later. And you'll find that this guy was married a lot. I started doing face lather. I decided I'm going to do a little bit in the mug first, and then I'm going to do face. So he was in the army. He was stationed in Japan and he got, uh, I don't think he got married. Excuse me. I was about to say he got married in Japan. I don't think he got married to this woman, but he did father a son with a German Japanese hostess. And I did find her name. It was crazy hard looking to pronounce. And I just, it, it, there wasn't really a lot about her aside from her name. So I just decided to keep moving from there. So he did have a son with her, German Japanese after World War II. I'm sure there's a story there in its own right. Um, let me thicken this up a bit. So he ended up going AWOL in the army. He was found and he was arrested. So while he was in custody, he strong armed a guard and escaped from custody after going a wall in the army. So real quick, the thing about McDuff soaps is they're soft. I've mentioned that before. So it's easy to overload a brush with too much of his soap, 
which I'm very good at doing. So, because of that, I'm very careful about overloading the brush. And so it's going on a little thin. And I'm gonna go right out of the toe, straight to the face, not use the mug. I kind of do a hybrid where I'll mug, sh I do m the mug and I'll have it for lather and suds for later in the shape for a second, third pass. But I kind of face lather to try to find the consistency I want straight from the tub to my face. So sorry if that's cringe worthy to anybody. Um, all right. So he went AWOL. There we go. Oh, and, uh, the scent of this comes out the, uh, ginger ale real predominantly right as soon as you start lathering but after it's built up on your face mm, that rye comes out a little bit of the maple syrup still lingers but you start getting all the rest of the scent notes for those interested in getting it it's a delicious soap it's very unique i like it a lot and Sean is, as I always say, he's amazing at throwing together ingredients that you wouldn't think would go well. Or just that you would be interested to see how they wind up and they go well perfectly. All right, so um, he was court-martialed. He was captured again, court-martialed in 1948. Master Green, second use. Uh, he received a dishonorable discharge. And he wound up spending two years in a federal prison for his antics in the army there. So he got out and it was rumored that William worked for a crime syndicate. I tried looking into that a little more. It was just rumors. There's nothing factual or written that it actually was true. But the later aspects of his life personally lead me to believe that it was true, that he was kind of basically doing mercenary work. Um, so... Uh, May 11th, 1954, he married a snake charmer named Ellen in Miami. By this time, he's living in Miami. And with Ellen, he had two more kids. So he has three kids at this point. Um, there's also no other mention of the German Japanese woman. So I'm assuming he just up and left them. I don't know if he like sent her money or kept in touch or any of that. I couldn't even find the name of the child that he had with her. So, um, so watching the news, I'm assuming while I lived in Florida, he was outwardly opposed to the dictatorship of Fulgencio Batista. He was the Dictator of Cuba in the 50s leading up to the Cuban Revolution. That is who Castro and his ilk overthrew. So he was always out. Uh, he left his wife and kids permanently, as it turns out, and went to Cuba in 1957. This is where his life gets crazy. He just up and left his American life, went to Cuba, decided to fight for the revolutionaries in Castro in Cuba. So, very quickly, um, he joined guerrilla, the guerrilla force of the Second National Front of the Escambray. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. I apologize. The Escambray are actually mountains. They were named after the mountains of Escambray in Cuba because they were doing 
operations and attacks out of those mountains. And they're based, they were based out of those mountains as well. Um, let me make sure I don't get myself near the mole and all that. I was being very timid. So very quickly, he established himself as a good fighter. So he proved himself remarkably quickly. I think it was within a year. Maybe, probably less. And he was actually given the rank of Commandante. Commander. Of the same battalion he himself had joined. So he was put in charge of a bunch of Cuban revolutionaries. An American of Cuban revolutionaries during the Cuban Revolution. Um... So it's pretty neat, pretty interesting that this American would be trusted to the point that he was given leadership of the thing that he himself had just joined. Or not just joined, but had joined. Quite an honor. So. One second. Sorry about the water, guys. Really apologize. All right, I'm gonna thicken this up a little bit. Sean's soaps are very slick as well. I personally feel like I'm not doing this justice really. I'm trying to get it a little thicker. It's a little on the thin side still. And again, I'm very careful because I always almost always overload with his soap because it's so soft so I'm being very cautious here there we go all right so December of 1958 Che Guevara the Che Guevara joined forces with uh, Morgan's battalion there And together they captured the city of Santa Clara on December 31st of that year. The uh, significance of this is that 12 hours later, Batista would flee Cuba. So them, this, this fight and them capturing this town led to Batista Basically, in essence, surrendering the, the country to Fidel Castro and Raul, his brother Raul and the forces, the re rebellion. So that was a huge part of Cuban history. Obviously, uh, Batista fleeing, but this battle culminated in that happening. Che Guevara, man, he, he served next to, next to Che Guevara. Um, September 1959... The U.S. State Department revoked Morgan citizenship. So it came with a cost. Obviously, it came with a cost when he left his family. Um, on, on a side note, I don't know if he meant to permanently leave his family or not. But when your citizenship is revoked and... Sorry, someone's writing me something. Uh, when your citizenship is revoked and you get kicked out of your, you know, told you can't come back to your own country, I think that'll affect you being able to return home. So I'm thinking maybe he didn't mean to be gone permanently, but um, in any case, that's ended up, what ended up happening. So he ended up getting remarried again in Cuba. He married, and I do have cliff notes here. That's why I keep looking down. There's a lot on this guy. Uh, he married Olga Maria Rodriguez. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I'm not trying to mock or anything. I'm trying to do the actual Cuban. Olga Maria Rodriguez, Rodriguez, a fellow revolutionary and had two daughters with her. So he's up to five kids now with three different women. Now, there were mention of his kids with this woman 
Uh, she was a fellow, fellow revolutionary, as I said, and she actually would come into the limelight in the United States media. So I think that's why they're a little more known, and I'll tell you why here in a sec. Um, so he ended up becoming a frog farmer in Cuba. And he captured frogs, and he would sell the skins for crafts and the legs for consumption. Frog's legs. I've actually had frog's legs. They're pretty good. They taste like chicken. Just not a lot of meat on them. But I've had fried frog's legs. They're yummy. I had them in Louisiana. That's a big bayou menu item. And at the apex of his business, he had 600 employees, over 600, and he was shipping 50,000 pounds of frog legs a month to the United States. Frog legs are like this big. I mean, the ones I ate were big. They were like that, you know, maybe about that long. But I mean, it's it's an island. And I, I'm sure you can't eat all of the frogs that are there. 50,000 a month, man. I can't imagine how he didn't make the frog species go extinct or at the very least hurt it considerably, make it all endangered. But that's what it said. 50,000 pounds of frozen frog legs a month. Anywho, so... Um, there's the Lacubre ship disaster. I really, I started writing off notes, getting too much into that. That might be its own thing at some point. But it was, in essence, it was a French vessel in port in uh, Havana, I believe, and it exploded. It just blew up, spontaneously exploded. No, I think to this day, no one knows why. Most people agree it was sabotage of some kind. And Morgan himself, someone flat out said that he was involved in it and he adamantly denied this. Adamantly. To the point that he, he got uh, angry at people for trying to say that he had anything to do with it. And actually, there was this photo that was famous at the time. This one. And you can see Fidel Castro going, you know, this way. Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, che Guevara is there in the middle. And then you see Morgan towards the end, second to the end there. And that's a famous photo of him walking arm in arm with them during the memorial of the La Cubre uh, disaster. So this guy was tight with him. Um, the other guys are revolutionaries. I didn't write their names down, but they're they're all named if you go look up that photo um, So pretty cool um, He had always been vo vocal about Castro's supposed anti-communist stance so Ca Castro didn't bring up communism really He didn't talk about it. He always said he was anti-communism during the revolution after he won, however, obviously, we know in history that Q, uh, Castro became the Soviet, one of the Soviet Union's closest allies and became very communist. So he had always been vocal about his beliefs. That's why he joined the revolution to begin with. And he, uh, Morgan actually had thought that Cuba would become a parliamentary um, capitalist democracy, just like America. Well, yeah, we know that didn't happen. So, he became disenchanted with Castro when his beliefs came out and became clear, his communist beliefs. Um, and Morgan's fellow revolutionary comrades who agreed with Morgan, all of a sudden they started getting arrested and disappearing. And so Morgan started becoming a counter-revolutionary, basically a double agent. He, he did not like the direction that Castro was taking it. And so he was forming alliances with people who were fighting Castro now, and he was actually smuggling weapons to these people. So he basically helped this guy get to power and then didn't like what happened and started fighting the guy he helped fight with. Um, so he was arrested October 19th. So after a while of this, uh, October 19th, he was arrested, arrested on Castro's orders. So Castro knew that he was, he was resisting him. And uh, 
he was charged with plotting with and leading the counter-revolutionaries. And here's yet another photo. This is a picture of Morgan after his arrest. This is him, I think, being possibly being marched out of the prison on his way to what ultimately happened to him, which I'll tell you in here in a second. But this photo, I looked at this photo. Um, the photos of people that I know, it's like right before something happened, I look at them, just trying to picture like what, you know, what, what could be in their mind in that moment, knowing that your demise is right there. And I look at this picture of him and it's cool. He, he looks, I don't know, rebellious. I don't know. What's the word I could use? I'm not even rebellious. It's not even stoic. He's just kind of like good day to die kind of look. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. It's just, it's very cool. I think it is right before he was, he was led to what happened to him. But uh, give me a sec. Let me wash this off. I'm going to do post, post shave. I'll let you know the rest of the story. Hair's really growing back in, isn't it? <laughs> I just had it poke my nose when I was washing. It's a good feeling, man. I miss, I mean, I'm glad I shaved it off. It was for a good cause, but I'm, I'm glad I'm growing it back. Uh, some of my family are not glad that I'm growing it back, but hey, what you going to do? So, all right. To finish the story, um, William Alexander Morgan was given a show trial in Havana, uh, La Cabana, sorry, La Cabana Fortress in Cuba. Quick little show trial. I don't know why they even bothered with the trial and they found him guilty of plotting against Castro's regime. He was executed by firing squad on March 11th, 1961. Fidel and Raul Castro, Castro made it a point to be there to witness it. So Fidel and Raul Castro, and Raul, keep in mind, is in charge of Cuba today. They were there to, to witness the execution. They sat there and watched it. Now, March 11th, 1961, for those who are really big on history, and I didn't even know this until I was looking into it, uh, a month later would be the Bay of Pigs invasion, the disastrous Bay of Pigs invasion okayed by Kennedy. So it's kind of weird to me when someone doesn't live to see a huge historical event so he, he was, a, I mean, he probably would have laughed or shaked his head, shaked his head and something just been like, yeah, what a disaster that was. But a month later, Bay of Pigs. Um, I don't know if JFK knew of Morgan's demise. Maybe he did. Maybe it had a little to do with his decision. I don't know. I couldn't really find anything. I'm sure if I went and looked, maybe I could find something. I, I mean, I don't see... If America, you know, the Cold War was so big in that time that almost certainly he had his own spy plane at that point, Morgan did. To have an American who's no longer American living in Cuba. They're probably keeping an eye on him. So almost certainly they had to know that he was executed. Um, so, 32 years old, executed. This is not the end of his story. So, if you remember, his wife, his Cuban wife, Olga, was tried in absentia because she was also a revolutionary, and obviously she was in cahoots with him as his wife. She was found guilty of conspiracy. The interesting thing is she was sentenced to 30 years. They did get her. She was tried, uh, sentenced to 30 years. She only served 10. I don't know what happened there, but she was let out after 10 years, one-third of her sentence, and she promptly moved in 1980 to the United States, which would have been whatever direction. I'm trying to picture in my head that way. Here's Cuba, here's Florida, that way. Um, or on camera, I don't know if it'll be, whatever. Anyway, 
in the screen of my phone, it's that way. Um, so she promptly started telling his story and fighting to get his citizenship. This Cuban woman, born in Cuba, raised in Cuba, now in the U.S., it's very interesting, who married this man who was born in the U.S., moved to Cuba. She was fight. She left her home country to come to his home country and fought his home country to get his citizenship back. And she ended up uh, fighting to have his citizenship brought back and to have his body returned. And she ultimately succeeded in both in uh, April of 2007. So he is now once again an American citizen and is recognized for what he did, at least by America. And uh, I can't remember the year she passed away. I want to say 2009, maybe. Um, I, I should have written that one now, but I forgot. I was, <laughs> I thought I overdid it with what I had here. So it's a remarkable story. This guy left everything in America to go fight for the Cubans and then pay the ultimate price for, for really, in essence, helping secure his, his, uh, success in the campaign against Batista. And it's just... You know, kind of sad. I mean, it's in there was a, a right after his citizenship was revoked, he wrote an, a kind of a speech of sorts that the New York Times published, and I was going to write it down. And I actually have part of it written here, and I scratched it out because I thought it was too long, but I really liked it. And it was called Why I Am Here. And the first sentence of it is, I am here because I believe that the most important thing for free men it, to do is to protect the freedom of others. And every sentence starts out, I am here. Why I am here. I am here because da da da. So he just felt like that's what he had to do. And he fought and probably, and he was obviously very good at it and helped Cuba become what it is, this, this American. So... Wish more people knew about him. I didn't know about him until I found him. But, uh, yeah. That's uh, William Alexander Morgan. Rest in peace, dude. You know, no one knows what went through your head but you. So, all right, guys. I really appreciate it. Forgot to mention, too, today's coffee was Costa Rica from Sterling. Very delicious. Like it a lot. And I wanted to show my shirt. This is for you, Sean, your music guy. And of course, I had to own a shirt with John Bonham on it for obvious reasons. So, all right. Thank you for watching, everybody, especially if you made it to the end. Hope you enjoyed the story. I'm going to try to branch out, and I'm going to go pick some world history next time. I've been keeping it a little close to home, but there's so much stuff out there that I want to, I want to tell someone else's story. Um, I have a good one for... World War II. I'm going to be doing a lot of World War II stuff, but this is one of my favorite stories. Um, so I think I'll do that one next. And it involves, yeah, I, I won't get into it. I have a World War I, a couple for World War I as well. So if you like these, let me know in the comments, guys. I really appreciate it. Let me know if there's anything specifically you can think of that I should do. Anything that you'd like me to change, anything I could do more of. Constructive criticism is always welcome. I appreciate it. Till next shave, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Take it easy. Be safe out there.